Hi, this is Luke Macias, host of The Luke Macias Show. Every week we come to you with news, politics, things going on that are shaping the Lone Star State. But today we're going to talk about how to vet candidates. In my previous life, I ran over 150 campaigns and honestly vetted, interviewed hundreds of candidates, maybe well over a thousand candidates all across Texas. And so I love talking to grassroots conservatives, to donors, even to uh, you know, other group leaders who are talking to candidates locally about how to actually vet the candidate. In this situation, we're going to break down how to vet this candidate into several parts. You want to find out who they are, you want to find out if they intend to compete, and you want to find out their work ethic, okay? So who they are is very simple. You're first going to have just a set of questions that probably all of you know. You want to know if this person is a full spectrum conservative individual. So you're going to ask them fiscally conservative questions. You're going to ask them socially conservative questions. Each and every one of these sets of questions is important to incorporate in all circumstances. I'll tell you, there was a situation where I was interviewing a county commissioner candidate inter introduced to me by a friend who I was going to run his campaign. And I walked him through all these different county policies and things like that. And at the end of the interview, I said, oh, I'm so sorry, but I forgot to ask you one question that doesn't really have to do with county government. But here you go. What do you think about abortion? When does life begin? And his answer was very nuanced. Well, ultimately, what I found out was that his wife raised money for Planned Parenthood. And this person who was aligned with the conservatives locally, who had been recruited by local conservative people to run for county commissioner, none of them knew this. And the truth is, it had never come up in any conversations because they never thought it was related to the office he was seeking. And that's why I'm going to encourage you to ask all of those questions. A simple question I started asking a couple of years ago is, how many genders are there? Now, today, actually, most people get that right, too, right? But you'd be surprised. There was a candidate who was introduced to me who was a local Republican leader thinking about running against a rhino Republican legislator. She was already backed and supported by a lot of my conservative friends in the area. And they said, hey, would you please vet this person and think about helping her run for office? And in the course of the conversation, she's, we're going through things. She likes free market economics. She owns a small business. All of these things are right. At the very end, I said, hey, forgot to ask you real quick, how many genders are there? And her answer was, well, it depends on who you ask. Well, what does that mean? Well, most people would say two, and I kind of lean there, but some people think like maybe seven, and I'm kind of open to that. Now, that answer showed me that this person didn't know what time it was, and wasn't the individual who I wanted to spend my own time, talent, and treasure electing, even if she was running against a rhino Republican legislator. So it's important to ask them full spectrum questions on issues. Another way I like phrasing it at the end is I will tell them, is there a position you hold on an issue that is out of step with the average conservative Republican? They'll usually say, oh, well, what is the average conservative Republican? And I'll say, look, this is my question to you. You just answer it. The average person, somebody who goes to church on a regular basis, watches some Fox News, listens to talk radio, listens to conservative podcasts, follows Tucker Carlson, whatever it is, that average person out there who's concerned about the direction of their country and supports Republican conservative policies, is there a position you have on any issue that you can think of? And sometimes one will come out. Well, I like legalizing meth or something. So this is why you have to ask that question in that way and put it on them. Hey, tell me something if there's a position you have that's out of lockstep. Then you want to know also who they are, okay? Not only what they believe, but who they are. So a way to ask this question is, I'll say, who is a federal politician? Most people follow federal politics. So you'll say, who's a federal politician that most aligns with your values? And then who's a federal politician who most aligns with your personality? And that's an interesting way of, of asking it to them and something that you will learn from. You will learn both where they stand on issues and who they feel like they are personally like, who they will behave like in office. It's really interesting. I was with the grassroots conservatives in the Texas Hill Country. We were vetting in 2015 looking for a conservative challenger to one of, at the time, Joe Strauss's top lieutenants and chairman. And we interviewed three different men. All were small business owners. All had been asked by local conservative uh, activists to run for office. 
One of them we asked this question to, and his answer, who ultimately was the one that we all supported, was he said, I'm kind of most like Donald Trump. And this was funny because it was like a month after Donald Trump had announced for the presidency. And this person ended up kind of being like Donald Trump. And he was supported and he did win. But the other person had another good answer. They said, well, I really like Ted Cruz and Rand Paul, and here's why. And that was helpful. And the third person who was a small business owner and had said all the right things in his interview on a bunch of issues, we said, who are you most like and who do you think aligns with your principles the most? And he said, probably Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey. And all of us looked at each other going, who is this guy and how did he get in our interview room? So it's a good question to ask, what federal politician are you most like personality wise and who aligns with you most? On, on policy principles. And when they say who, then ask them why. So if they say, well, this is who I'm like, why, how are you like them? This is who most aligns with my principles. In what way? Can you tell me positions that he holds that reflect your principles, the way he's taken stands in the past? So that's who he is, what he believes or what she believes. So those are questions you're going to ask. Next, you're going to go to the section of whether or not they intend to compete. Now, if you're meeting with somebody running for school board, you can kind of know in general, this person is going to need to knock at least 1,500 doors. That takes 15 full-time days. This person is gonna need to raise between five and $15,000, depending on the school board they're running for, how big it is, how many voters there are. These are questions you can ask them though. The question, if you don't know the answer, then put it on them. How much money do you need to win? How many people are gonna vote in your election? What is your plan? This is really pulling back on whether they intend to compete or not, right? And the question is one of two things. Do they already have a plan that they can explain to you that yes, they clearly intend to compete in this way? Or are they telling you, I don't know the answers to that, but I, I need to know and then I need to know how to get there. Do they intend to compete? Do they have a plan that actually seems like it has a path to victory in some form or fashion? You're going to spend your time, talent, and treasure in a limited way. And every time you knock a door for a day or write a hundred or fifty or twenty-five dollar check or call some of your friends and get them involved in a campaign, you could be doing that same thing for another race somewhere else in the state. I've known conservative grassroots activists who've literally gotten vans together of eight or ten people and they've driven an hour and a half just to block walk for somebody they knew was going to be a conservative fighter if they got elected. And that was worthwhile to them because they didn't have someone locally. So ultimately, tell these people, I'm asking you these questions because this is going to determine how I spend my time, talent, treasure, who I put my name behind, who I put my organization's name behind, ultimately. Do they intend to compete? A lot of people run for office because they want to go to Republican clubs and they want to make speeches and they want to attend debates. And that's really what they want to do. They don't actually want to go out and knock 4,000 doors. They don't actually want to call everybody they know and ask them for money so that they can raise enough money to actually compete against some rhino establishment incumbent Republican that they're going to try to challenge. And so if that's not their intention, if they're not saying, I need to figure out everything I need to do, then they're going to struggle to actually be a candidate, maybe worth your time to support. Lastly, you're going to focus on their work ethic. And this is going to come in several ways. First, we're going to talk about fundraising. I would not recommend, unless you know this person well, they're a friend and you're going to support them. I wouldn't recommend supporting them financially until the people around them have supported them financially. One of the first questions I ask candidates, even still today, that call is how many people do you know that know you that if you call them will answer the phone and say, hey, insert first name, okay? That is the level of relationship. How many of those people are there in your life? And how many of them do you think will give you money? And how much money do you think that adds up to? Okay. Now, sometimes I've had people say, there are 50 people in my life that fit that description. And I think if I call them all, I'll raise $4,000. And there have been people I've met that said, I know 250 people at that level or 300. And if I call them all, I'll raise $400,000. And I tell people, I don't really care where you fall on the spectrum. The real question is, do people that know you and trust you believe in you enough to give you even five or 10 or $25 to run for office? Or do you just not have any friends? 
And if you don't have any friends, if, if you are a middle-aged American who lives in this community, but doesn't have anybody you know that wants to show up and help you and support you financially in something you're doing to exert yourself in a greater cause above yourself, then maybe you're not the type of person that I really want to spend my time, talent, and treasure backing and supporting. It's not only work ethic, but it also just comes down to who they are as a person. So the type of work ethic you're looking for is basically saying, hey, how many, if they're asking you for money, you don't know this guy, but you think he might be a conservative. You've decided, yes, you do believe what I believe and you would be good. Your next question is, how many people have you asked for money? And how many people have said yes? And how much money have you raised? And the answer to that question is going to tell you whether you want to also join in that effort. You can put conditions on your support. You can say, hey, after you've gotten 50 donations to your campaign, I'm going to be the 51st. And not only will I be the 51st, but I'm going to talk to everybody in this room. We all want to give you money. But we all want to give you money after you've gone out and proven your ability to get other people to give you money as well. Because we know that's what it's going to take to win. The same thing goes for the time you spend on a campaign. Again, if you're going to go block walk for a day, you can hit between 60 and 100 doors, depending on how good you are, how often you've done this, and how dense the area is that you're talking uh, to voters in. But my recommendation would be any candidate, unless he's proven himself to you in the past, you're going to tell him, hey, when you've knocked on your 500th door, let me know. A lot of times if somebody's running for like state legislature or something above like school board or city council or county commissioner, I'll say, hey, when you've knocked on your 1,000th door, let me know. And it's really interesting because you'll have four or five people all running for the legislature. You'll say, when you knock on your 1,000th door, let me know. And the first one to call you back is almost every single time going to be the best candidate that cycle. And the last person to call you back is more than likely going to get well below 30% of the vote. And the effort that you would put into helping their campaign would likely not be enough to push them over the finish line. Each and every one of us has to work together. There's not a single person that I know in Texas that can single-handedly just decide who gets pushed over the finish line. It takes a team. It takes efforts of people coming together. And so the truth is what you're trying to discern when you're vetting candidates, asking them who they are, asking them what they believe, asking them who they align with, who they identify with, asking them if they intend to compete, trying to discern their type of work ethic and the type of relationships they have with people who actually know and trust them. When you're discerning all of that, you're figuring out what team am I going to be a part of? Because you single-handedly will not push someone over the finish line, but you could be involved, and we've all been involved in the last 10 years in some of the most important and crucial elections. When my dad ran for state representative in 2006 against a rhino Republican incumbent, we had never run for anything before. 90 days before the election, we decided to file. We ran a really hard campaign and won by 45 votes of 20,000 cast. And I will tell you that every single weekend when I would call friends of mine from church or people that I was homeschooled with and tell them to come out. That wasn't just my brothers and sisters. There were other people. We did other homeschool things. But the point is that when I would tell these people to come out and block walk for a Saturday and two or three of my friends would come together and we'd hit 180 doors in a day, we'd have 30 meaningful conversations with people. I would have people that I talked to at the door. When you win by 45 votes, you can look back and realize that those calls to get people out, that meet and greet that somebody put together, those doors that somebody came out and knocked on a weekend could literally be the final straw that pushed that campaign over the finish line. And countless times in the past, conservatives have won by just the smallest of margins. Some of the strongest fighters that we have today, Matt Rinaldi, who won his state house rep of, of representatives race by just a couple hundred votes. Senator Bob Paul, the most conservative state senator in Texas, who's a grassroots champion for all of us, got into a runoff and then won by just several hundred votes. Every single bit of conservative effort that happened in those campaigns mattered. And you don't know in any given election. So what you're doing is you're vetting these candidates to discern if this is the type of team that you want to jump on to see if you can help be a small part of their victory. Hopefully this has been helpful in letting you know and giving you some tools to discern and vet candidates. Please continue to fight hard to advance our conservative values and principles in Texas. They're worth fighting for. Thank you, and God bless.